Good morning. Can you guys hear me? Thank you. Thanks, Cal, for inviting me to speak today. Um, I'm excited to be here. We at Navitas uh, just opened our Chicago office earlier this year, so I'm looking forward to getting more connected into the Chicago innovation community in this space. We were out of LA for a long time, and we still have that office in LA, but um, getting getting more integrated now in Chicago. So just quickly on Navitas, um, we define prop tech pretty broadly, actually, so covering a lot of the aspects that Kyle uh, mentioned earlier, but we think about the entire really life cycle of buildings as being in scope and construction tech for us is just one of the segments within prop tech. We think about investment in real estate, the construction and renovation of buildings and assets, the leasing, marketing, sales and customer experience of those buildings. And then finally the operations and maintenance of, of those buildings. Um, so Navitas has been around since 2009. So at the very early end of that graph, Kyle showed where there was really very little investment in this space. And so we've had the benefit of really seeing the explosion of interest from you know, the VC community, as well as from founders you know, who have now poured into the industry and have been interested in building uh, technology for, for this segment. You know, because we have been around uh, since since the beginning, we've had the luxury of of being along for the ride and uh, backing some of the like preeminent, I would say, companies that have emerged in this space that were VC backed. So companies like Plan Grid in construction, like Procore, like Matterport on the real estate side, and more recently, companies that have become really category defining leaders in the space, like Open Space uh, in construction again and then lesson uh, in the home services side. Um, you know, what we do is we are sector focused. So, you know, there are gen many generalist VCs that also invest in the space. We are solely focused on real estate and construction as end markets. And what we do is we try to really understand those industries, work with communities like the folks in this room to understand the pain points. Where are there pockets of potential value, of potential pain to be solved, and where can technology, you know, really meet those those gaps? We're not here looking at a shiny technology and investing it because it could have impact. We're here un to understand where is that going to drive returns for the industry and are therefore more likely to be adopted and really see the growth that uh, we would expect, you know, as investors. Um, our industry network, I'll just mention, you know, some of that is the relationships that we've built, um, you know, just in the spaces that we invest in, but others are financial as well. We are backed primarily, our funds are backed primarily by strategic LPs, and that's across the real estate spectrum. So, you know, think large REITs, public REITs that are, you know, operating single family rentals, apartments, commercial office, industrial assets. We have construction materials companies, we have home builders, we have other developers, and those are all part of you know, this network that we bring to bear as we think about both investing, but also supporting our portfolio companies in their growth. So um, you know, today I'm just gonna give a brief talk on sort of the, the journey that PropTech has, has been on. Um, you know, we saw the meteoric, meteoric rise in terms of the funding, but what has that actually meant in terms of change for the industry? And you know, I think there have been some hard lessons learned, and so I'll kind of go over what some of those things are, what we've learned along the way, um, and you know where we think there are really exciting and bright spots going forward. You know, we fundamentally believe that this is a industry or a set of industries that is under digitized, uh, and we don't think that's really by accident. There are structural reasons, I think, why real estate and construction have not you know, had the same adoption of technology and innovation as other industries, but there's also funding reasons. We look at FinTech, which we think is maybe a decade uh, more advanced right now than, than real estate and construction tech and see that as, you know, the model that we're gonna follow. VC money poured into FinTech over that last decade in a way that, you know, really has revolutionized that industry. We don't go to brick and mortar banks anymore to do our banking. We don't have to go into locations to transfer money. You know, th that industry has truly changed because of um, the innovation that is poured in. And much of that is venture backed. Not all of it is. 
I'm not here to say that venture-backed companies are the only route to innovation, but venture-backed startups have pushed the industry to the place where it is today. And we think that real estate and construction tech is on that journey as well. We think that the money that has started to come into the space is going to push the industry forward in a similar way. Today though, FinTech still gets five times the VC investment that real estate and construction tech do, even though those industries are less than, are, are about half the size of real estate and construction just from an impact on the economy standpoint. So just a little bit of the history, and I could put you know other logos more familiar to maybe the AEC industry on here, like like Rhino, for example, right? But um, we started, you know, if you think back prior to even the year 2000, there were a set of kind of legacy software companies that were really the enterprise software for the space. Kind of the analogy would be SAP or Oracle, but real estate companies were building their organizations on the back of these enterprise software companies and really data companies like RealPage, like CoreLogic, like Black Knight in the, in the mortgage space. And these were heavy software. So when I mean heavy, I mean hard to implement. You know, it took massive teams of consultants to implement, hard to train people on, but very sticky too, and really drove a lot of value for these organizations because everyone in the organization starts to use the platform. It's part of their daily workflows, and you know, they're it, it, they're hard to get off of. But this was kind of the backbone on which a lot of the later innovation was built. Then you kind of had an early way, which really mirrored, you know, the internet era in terms of thinking about search. So Google and Yahoo and others, right, were kind of emerging on the consumer side. And on the prop tech side, you saw a wave of how do I search for properties better? Whether that's apartments, whether it's vacation rentals, whether those are commercial properties, you know, this is effectively just organizing information in a digital way and allowing people to access that. They're not participating in the transactions, which are, you know, incredibly complex, um, but they're just putting that information at people's finger fingertips. And so a lot of large companies came about in the early 2000s, really focused on this, this search concept for real estate. You know, after that, you had... Um, really what we think of as like the first class of VC-backed companies. Um, and we would categorize these as digitally native brands and operators. A lot of what they were doing is the same thing as, you know, a traditional company in the space, uh, a brokerage company like Compass, a insurance company like Hippo or Lemonade. They're offering the same services as a brick and mortar company or a more traditional company, they're just putting it on the internet. They're acquiring customers via search, via internet marketing. They may have some digital tools. They're uh, disrupting the industry though by becoming a competitor against the traditional players, not necessarily providing technology for the industry as much as forcing the rest of the industry to adopt technology to keep up. You had the rise of vertical SaaS. So these are companies that are focused on workflows for large segments of the industry. Appfolio on rental management. You guys are familiar most likely with PlanGrid and Procore, Blend on the mortgage side, and then VTS in, in office. And these companies targeted big segments of the industry where just getting processes from pen and paper, from Excel, you know, from kind of disparate and silo tools onto the cloud, you know, into more collaborative tools actually had a big benefit on the organizations that they were working with. You started to see just more digitization of space. So, you know, bringing the, phys or the physical into the digital, whether it was scanning space like Matterport and, you know, having that datafied record of what buildings look like, whether it's putting, you know, uh, cloud connected uh, hardware into space in order to be able to control it, access data from it, um, and, 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 and understand how your buildings are performing. And then you had marketplaces. So Airbnb and Porch. Porch, you could argue, is a little bit more search than marketplace as well. 
um, but how do you actually, you know, transact different parts of sort of real estate on, on the internet? And so, you know, together these were the first graduating class, we call them, uh, of PropTech, primarily venture-backed, primarily going public or spacking over the last couple of years. Um, and, you know, as mentioned before, Navitas had the benefit of kind of being part of uh, the four that are highlighted here. Um, PlanGrid exited, you know, to Autodesk, as many of you guys know, but the rest kind of entering the, the public space. You know, unfortunately, uh, the, the picture has not been rosy from a financial performance perspective. So this is a chart of what each of these companies' stock performance is today relative to when they IPO'd. So you can see that it has been a little bit of a bloodbath. Um, <laughs> and I think if you charted a lot of the companies that went public over the last couple of years, it wouldn't look too dissimilar. But this industry in particular, I would say, has had significant challenges. And I'll talk about that you know, in a moment in terms of what some of those lessons learned are. I think you can see that on the right-hand side, the, the marketplaces and the SaaS companies have on average performed a little bit better. Um, Blend was you know, doing okay until obviously the mortgage industry has just really collapsed um, for you know, reasons that they cannot control. Um, and on the left-hand side, your real operators of real estate that had a, you know, tech, maybe veneer to them are the ones that have really, you know, had their, um, uh, they've really had their lunch eaten, I guess. Um, you know, just in terms of uh, investor sentiment and investors really realizing that if you are in the operating business, you actually have to have efficient operations relative to your maybe non-tech-enabled uh, competitors. So um, lessons learned, right? Um, we're not here to say that one type of company is better than another. We invest in software companies. We invest in tech-enabled services. We invest in marketplaces. Um, one of the things that has been very clear, though, as this is all shaken out, is just getting clearer on are you a technology provider or are you a tech enabled blank? And investors and startup founders being clear about that choice because it impacts how you think about how you grow your business, what metrics matter, and how you should really capitalize your business going forward. On the technology side, you know, you might struggle in many ways because we all know that in these industries, there's not very large technology budgets. And so you're, you're having to argue for your spot in that budget, which might also be taken up by hardware, by you know, CRMs like Salesforce, like Microsoft licenses, right? How do you argue to, for, for your company to deserve a spot in that technology budget? You have to be very thoughtful about what your ROI is. I think increasingly when we think about investment, the companies in this bucket, they can't only provide a time savings ROI. Time savings is great for individuals using the software. Organizations aren't always willing to pay for just time savings ROI unless it means they can cut their staff. And that often isn't necessarily the case. And so you have to think about, am I gonna boost my customer's revenue? Am I somehow gonna save on other costs? Am I gonna reduce risk? Like what am I actually providing other than I'm making your workflow faster and easier? Those are great, but how do I quantify that for the organization that I'm selling to? If you've done that, you get the right to demand a technology multiple on your business. Um, and so we as investors then have to be disciplined about investigating that. Uh, on the right-hand side, you know, if you're a tech-enabled operator, you have to actually show that you will be more efficient, grow faster, have some sort of edge over incumbents. So if you're a tech-enabled engineering firm, somehow you actually have to have better margins than a traditional engineering firm who 
also might have technology, by the way. So um, these things should also get valued in the market in the same way that a traditional company might. So if I'm an engineering firm, if I you know, were to sell to a private equity group at an EBITDA multiple, so too should a tech-enabled engineering firm. Uh, ideally, they have a higher EBITDA margin or something like that, right? So as investors, we have to interrogate that and ask, do we actually believe that that is going to drive a differential outcome in this business? What's good about tech-enabled operators, though, is they get to sell into markets that understand how to buy them. So if I'm a tech-enabled engineering firm, people know how to buy engineering, right? Because they already spend billions of dollars on those services. I, you know, get to compete in a way that, you know, uh, is, is in some ways easier. But, you know, I also have to build out a capacity in terms of staff and other uh, operational aspects that a purely software solution would not have to do. Okay, so doom and gloom aside, you know, we continue to think there's just still so much opportunity in this space. And so um, just sharing at a high level what our main investment themes are Industry digitization is very simple, but there are still so many different segments of this industry that have not been digitized, where the data has not been connected yet, where people are in working in different silos. And the opportunity to create platforms that connect all of those things and bring it into a, a, a new technology stack um, is still massive to us. AI, obviously, that's been the buzz you know, for the last year or so. We've been investing behind uh, this theme of AI for the better part of a decade. And we think there's the opportunity there not just to automate you know, work in the space, but really enhance and augment you know, the work that people are doing in these industries. Energy transition, uh, I feel like I can't have a conversation with someone in the industry these days without talking about regulation that's already happened or oncoming regulation or just client demands around, you know, sustainability and decarbonization. So uh, the technologies that are really underpinning that are of, of interest to us and the impact I think that we'll see around electrification of buildings and how that, you know, really changes the grid in the future also I think extends how we think about the built environment out into infrastructure as well. And then finally, fintech. You know, we've talked about the maturation of that uh, uh, ecosystem from a, a financial services technology standpoint. That overlay with real estate uh, transactions with construction uh, is where you know we we think there's a lot of opportunity still going forward. Um, so I'll leave you with just six interesting companies. Uh, three of them are our portfolio companies, and three of them are not. Just in this notion that, you know, we think that the companies in this sector are actually going to change, like, how we go about our daily lives and the fabric of, of our communities. Um, so quickly here, Tango Builder is a very early stage company. They're in the structural engineering space. They, they create software where they've taken algorithms from aerospace to apply them to structural design. So the concept there is that they can really automate and optimize structural designs, taking that process from weeks into days. And the structures that they design are lighter weight, they use less materials, and are therefore less costly to build going forward. Swift Connect, they just raised a $10 million Series A recently, which was just announced yesterday, I think. Um, they are Okta or single sign-on for the built environment. This notion that, you know, we have this ability to use one credential for all of the software that we use, but we don't have that to enter buildings or other spaces. So they layer onto existing physical access control technology, put it in your wallet. You know, you can use biometrics and then really have access to, you know, a set of spaces that could be connected. They're starting an office and really having that employee badge in your wallet, but are expanding into other asset classes as well. 
Um, Optalot, I talked about the energy transition. This is a residential energy management app. They are optimizing consumer uh, energy loads, particularly ones who have EVs and smart thermostats, and then really connecting them to utilities and wholesale energy providers so that you know the grid is not being over overburdened by uh, EV charging and other spikes in energy usage in the home. Um, so those three are our portfolio companies. Um, the three on the bottom are not our portfolio companies, but you know we've been kind of watching them and have been excited about them over time. Welcome Homes is doing uh, semi-custom infill development. They're honestly like an asset light home builder. They underwrite plots of land using kind of automated algorithms and they uh, engage consumers in the process so that they can build homes more easily on infill sites. Um, yeah, obviously, Kyle is working on a you know similar platform in some ways, but this notion that you know infill development is really where we need to go to improve and increase the amount of housing that's available in our cities. Uh, permit flow is permitting software, so term TurboTax for permitting, you know just a very burdensome process, as most of you all probably all know, um, that can be digitized. And then finally, a Bodu. I think this ADU trend, when we first looked at it, you know, maybe two or three years ago, we thought it was going to be a localized thing, you know, in California. It's clearly increased tremendously uh, in different jurisdictions across the U.S. as a, one potential solution to the housing crisis. And Abodu is one of the first, you know, ADU companies that's really productized that and gone to market and is, is probably the most scaled ADU provider today. So just six companies to, to watch out for. You know, we continue, like I said, to think the space is, is um, uh, exciting to invest in. We're just closing out our, our third fund and are about to start deploying out of our fourth fund. And so if any of you want to connect, please... Uh, contact me in, in any of these ways. Kyle actually found me on Medium. We do you know a fair amount of just blog posting on what we're seeing in the space. And so I would love to stay in touch with anybody through any of these means. Thank you.